In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How good, Lord, to be here, my dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Those are the words of St. Peter. We've been hearing them throughout our service today. Certainly heard them in our gospel just a few moments ago. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build a shelter, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And, and we, can, we can be excused for, for understanding that, that Peter's being a little foolish here. It's easy for us to, to kind of point out to Peter, hey, come on now, Jesus certainly can't stay on that mountain forever, right? He's got more important things to do, you know, like saving the world from sin. He can't stay up there forever. But I understand where Peter is coming from. I mean, he catches this glimpse of heaven, this wonderful light, and it kind of starts to make sense to him, this, this person that they're following, and, and it makes sense to want to stay there forever because finally, finally it was all true, right? It was, it was all very real. No more parables, no more vague statements, no more talk. Now it was action. Now Jesus was finally showing his glory, and wait till the Pharisees see this then there's not going to be any more doubts, right? There's not going to be any more fights, no more arguments, no more resisting. Lord, it's good for us to be here. I can understand if, if Peter was starting to think that maybe now that light of Jesus was starting to pierce the darkness around them. I understand that. Because I've kind of felt the same way from time to time in my own life. Lord, when are you going to finally reveal yourself? When, when are you going to make your name known throughout this earth? When are you going to finally come down and prove that you're there? Sure would make my work a lot easier if it was obvious that your glory shined throughout this world. Sure it would be great, Lord, if, if you would take that, that sinful habit that I keep falling into over and over in my life away from me because then I could serve you so much better. I could do so much more. Right, you understand, Lord? It's, it's good to be here. I see this glory. I see where, where we're at here on this Mount of Transfiguration. I think to myself, this is good. This is what we want. This is what we need. At least I think it's good. And you see the same thing in your own life. You see the darkness of this world. You see certainly plenty of wickedness in your own life or in the life of the people around you, the ones that you love. I mean, how many more trips to the hospital, Lord? How many more times to rehab? How many more times to the marriage counselor? How many more times do we have to deal with a setback or a frustration or a financial problem? How many more times, Lord, all of this darkness? It's not that this world is all bad, right? Like, it, like it's all bad all the time. But we understand it would be great to have a little bit more of God's light. It would be great if Jesus could just be with us on the mountain forever. And then we look around at the life of the church and, and we think to ourselves, man, it would be great if, if more people would come to hear God's word, right? Wouldn't that be great if, if more people would just come here to our church, if they would just listen to this message, if they would hear it, they would know, they would know the joy of the gospel, they would know all of this, it'd be great. I mean, how many of you haven't said to yourselves at the end of an Easter service that, that, boy, it would be nice if it were like this every Sunday, right? It'd be, it'd be great if it were like this all the time, that this church would be filled with people. Certainly, it's true. This place ought to be filled up every Sunday, right? You know that. You, you know what that means, that, that people should come here to hear God's word. But it, it says something. It says something about our culture, doesn't it? When, when people are more willing to camp out for free chicken sandwiches or cheap television sets or, or playoff tickets instead of coming and filling up God's house. Don't they know what they're missing? No, they don't. Because the veil covers their hearts. Their ve the veil covers their lives. And St. Paul had to deal with the same thing in his time 
with his people. He had to deal with with people who who stubbornly refused to listen to the message. And and so as we find ourselves again in the book of 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, Paul is again defending his ministry. He's trying to, to, to show these believers what it means that he has a wonderful ministry, this wonderful message, this, this wonderful gift of light for the world and for these people. And he uses that, that story of Moses with the shining face to help them understand this. And we heard that just a few moments ago, how when Moses would go into the presence of the Lord to speak to him, he'd speak to him face to face, and, and somehow miraculously he was allowed to receive a portion of God's glory. And, and then when he came out, he would... He was shine. He was splendor. With, with was shining with God's splendor, and he didn't realize that at first. But everybody's gawking at him. They're staring at him. They're wondering what kind of strange appearance this is. So Moses puts a veil over his face, so that people will stop staring at him and start listening to the message that he was proclaiming, to start hearing the word of the Lord. But they couldn't. They were too dull. They were too stubborn. They didn't want to because. On the one hand, they were distracted, but on the other hand, they wanted to do it all themselves. They wanted to do the work. They heard God's message, and and they thought that they could earn their way into God's good graces. So they couldn't hear this message of God's love, because their hearts were covered with this veil of darkness. But Paul knew that, that only Christ could pierce that veil. Only Christ could destroy it. Only Christ and his light and his love could cut through the unbelief and the the coldness and and the the hardness of heart and and change that person and do away with the darkness and give them the light of God's love. Only Christ could change that person into the likeness of Christ with his light so that, that they could shine with the light of Christ in their life. Only in Christ could any of that happen. So Paul wasn't ashamed of the work that he had to do. He didn't lose heart. He didn't lose hope. He knew that that Christ was working through him. He knew that his life was was reflecting the light of Christ. He knew that as he shared that message with other people, that that light would pierce the veil of their hearts too and bring them into the light. I think sometimes we forget how often and how easy it is for us to put a veil over our own hearts and lives. And, and we forget how, how much that can hold us back in our life as children of God. We look around and, and, and we see that more people need to hear about Jesus, but, but so often we make excuses for why Christ's message can't be more effective. Well, this culture, right? This, this culture that we live in is just anti-Christian. Or, or people just aren't raised in the church anymore, so they just don't know. Or, or, you know, these millennials nowadays, oh man, they don't care about religion or anything like that. They're too wrapped up in their lives or their phones or whatever, right? We make excuses for why Christ's message can't be more powerful. But are you really so dull? Is Christ really that weak that he can't overcome all of those things? Or is it something else? Is it that maybe we're just being stubborn? You see, there's always going to be a part of us that doesn't want to do what God says. And there's always going to be that stubborn part of us that doesn't want to live the kind of bold and hopeful life that God wants us to live. And so if the church is declining in our families, if the church is declining in our country, if the church is declining in our neighborhoods, is it because somebody has personally come to you and told you, stop telling me about Jesus? Because that is the only reason we should shake the dust off our feet and move on to somebody else. Or could it be that we're just being stubborn? And that we cover our hearts with a veil of stubbornness so that we don't see the light of Jesus. And we don't see that that light of Jesus is for other people too, not just me. What is it that people are looking for in life? 
If I went on a man of the street tour like Jay Leno used to do, remember that? How he used to ask people questions and get answers. If I, if I used to do that, and I asked 100 people here in West Dallas, what are their goals, their achievements, what they want to accomplish in life? How many of them you think are going to tell me, I want to become a member of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church or, or some other church in the area here, right? I don't think I'm going to get too many out of that 100. I doubt I'd get one, right? But what are people looking for in life? I don't know. They're looking for making sure their kids are raised decently. They, they, they want to make it to the next paycheck. They want to get healthy. They, they, they want to make something out of their lives. They're looking for significance. They're looking for some answer to the question in their hearts, does my life matter? Do I matter? And, and what, where do they go to answer that question? Well, they, they go to their jobs. They go to their kids. They, they go to some accomplishment, some, some task that they need to do, right? It's work, and it's work, and it's work, and it's slavery. Being slaves to, to all this effort to try to prove to themselves or to their families or to society or to God himself that they are worth something. It's slavery. But what did Christ come to give? Did you catch that in 2 Corinthians? Where Jesus is, there is the Spirit, and there is freedom. Freedom. Freedom that comes from the cross of your Savior. Freedom that comes from the only one who could give you and me and this whole world of sinners significance and purpose. Because when Christ died on the cross... He died as a slave. He died as a slave to the law of God. Right? Was there any more, more perfect slave than Jesus? Anyone who, who, who from the moment he could, could think and conceive of, of a thought from, from the day that he breathed his last and said it is finished, that he wasn't perfectly keeping God's law holy. And, and he wasn't perfectly doing all of the things that God said to do in his law. His whole life, he was a slave to God's law, and he did it perfectly, so that when he died on the cross, he could give you that perfection, that he could give to you the light of his perfection and pierce the darkness of your heart too, and give you light, and give you freedom. Freedom from the expectations of having to prove to God that your life is worth something. Freedom from having to prove to yourself, freedom from, from this slavery to the law, this slavery to expectation, this slavery to whatever. Freedom to know that God doesn't hold grudges. God isn't waiting for you to prove that you're worthy enough to be loved, that, that God loves you already in Christ, that your sins have been paid for, and you have a place in God's heart forever. Does this sound a little bit like what people are looking for? That is the significance that we have in Christ. As Christ's light pierces that veil, he pierces your heart and he gives you God's love. When Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, do you remember what happened? Remember what happened in the temple? How that veil that hung in the temple that symbolized the separation between God and man, that, that thick curtain that was feet tall and inches thick, tore in two from top to bottom. The veil had been destroyed. The veil of sin, the veil of darkness, the veil of unbelief had been taken away and the way to God was open. My friends, you and I have nothing to be ashamed of. We have no reason to lose hope in this world. We have every reason to have great hope and great encouragement because you have the light of God's glory. You have the light that pierced the darkness of unbelief. You have the light of forgiveness. The light that changes you into the likeness of Christ. The likeness of Christ is what? His love, right? What is Christ but love? And what do people want in this world but love? Significant unconditional, no strings attached to love, and you've got it. 
You've got it. Now you get to share that love with other people so that that same light that has pierced your own heart, that same light that has changed you into the likeness of Christ, that same light that takes you from one glory to another to eternal's glory can change the lives of other people too. There's no reason for you and me to hide that glory like Moses did behind that veil. There's no reason that we have to wonder and worry if, if Christ is finally once and for all going to reveal himself. You are the glory. We are the glory. That light has pierced the darkness of your veil, the, the veil that shrouds us in the darkness of unbelief. That light has pierced you, and now you can live, really live. You can live beyond the veil. Amen.